relationship of this line to that. Now, three, you might get the relationship of this line to that. All right? I have to write the unit. In order to understand what this number is, I have to tell you how big one is. Now, what's six? The product of two and three. It's a line also. It's a line. It's six way out. And it's like so. You've got six notches. Or six notches. And the way of looking at it is to say that the problem is this. I want to convert three to six. I want to multiply by two. The idea is that the three line that I had before bears the same relationship to the answer that I'm trying to get, the six line, as the two bears to the one. Six is twice three in the sense that this relative to that is the same as the two to one. Right? The idea is then that the answer should bear, of multiplication, should bear the same relationship to one of the things you're trying to multiply as the other thing does to the unit. Voila. Let's see. I want to multiply this by that. And what I have to do then is to create a line which bears the same relationship to this line as this one does to that. Yes. I have to, just like I did over there, I have to find a new this answer. It has to have the same relationship to this line as this has to that. Now let us draw the answer that I drew over here, over here, so you can see its relationship to that line. What's the relation of this and this? The relation of this and this is a certain proportion in size and a certain angle. Can you imagine that thing turn so it's in this, and you see that it's the same angle and the same proportion as the original one to this to one? In other words, the relation of this line to that is the same geometrically. So that's why it's multiplied, because it has the same geometrical property, a property, though, that fits on lines which are tilted, not just lines which are horizontal. Uh, it's interesting, the mathematicians, mathematicians developed all this mathematics for these crazy numbers without having anything to apply it to directly in physics, and that it should turn out to be so fundamental to the bottom laws of physics to be used in such funny numbers or complex numbers. So that's the other feature. And I'll just uh, uh, say one more thing to finish this. That means that we can understand what happens in a given situation by a sequence of, as if it's a sequence of events. Instead of, you see, when I was talking before, I would say a thing comes from the source and goes to the, the, to the photo multiplier, and I gave you the answer for one operation. You turned it, and you made a little line. But I can talk about it in several operations. I could say, it goes from here to here. You start with an arrow. When it goes from one point to the other, just turn it around according to the time. Reflection. Reflection is a little one-fifth arrow. Multiply by that. That means shrink it down. Next, go from here to here. That means take the result and do again the same next thing, which is rotate. Now, the, finally, I would like to say, what I'm going about, about to say is to show you that we have still simpler laws than the ones that I talked about. We have been talking only about one color light and talked about the amplitude depending on the time in that fashion. What is the difference between one color light and another color light? The speed at which that goes around. But in space, light is light is light is light and doesn't know where it came from. And what another picture, a different picture is this. That light, if you want to like to know the amplitude that it arrives at a, at a certain time, I'm going to put time into this argument now. It arrives at a certain time in the photo multiplier. We suppose, well, I, I think, since I haven't figured out, I'm sorry, this is very uh, amateur, isn't it? I haven't figured out what I'm going to talk about completely next lecture, and I haven't got quite enough stuff to fill it up. And therefore, I'm going to leave this little thing <laughs> in the next lecture so I can fill it up.
I will tell you what the idea is that the time has to do with the. Uh, well, I'll discuss that the next time. There's other. <laughs> the other thing is, I have tried, and I, in the case of monochromatic light, I have completely described the rules for the amplitude. If I add one more thing, which I haven't, that is, I have to talk about what happens in a vacuum first. And when a particle go, light goes a certain distance, it's true that the angle turns, but there's another rule which I have not discussed because it's only not very interesting relatively, and that is that the amplitude to go a certain distance, beside turning, shrinks. If you go far, it gets smaller. Everybody knows that the chance of finding a particle far away from the source goes down as the square of the distance. And that means that the amplitude goes down as the distance. In other words, if you, when I was drawing these arrows, as I made them go further, I should have shortened them a little bit. Those are kind of approximations. They have nothing to do with the excitement of how it works, and I didn't want to bother you with such accurate detail. But if I once tell you that the thing turns at a certain rate and goes down in length proportional to the distance as it went, I have completely defined exactly the properties of the propagation of light of one color except for one other technical thing. <laughs> light, as it turns out, it turns, it, it, even if you specify the color, I have to say this in order to tell you exactly you know, how much you know and how much I haven't mentioned. If you, even if you specify the color of the light, there's one other feature that light can have. There are two kinds of photons with the same color. We say they're polarized. They're, uh, if you use Polaroid, for example, you let through a light that has only one kind of axis. And another piece of Polaroid lets through the same kind of photon. But if you set that other piece of Polaroid for its axis the other way, so that it'll pass light with the other kind, then no light will get through, because the first one only passes one kind and the second the other. All these effects of Polaroid and polarization have been entirely left out of this discussion. Why? Because my purpose is to give you a complete feeling of the difficulty of the subject, of the, the interesting philosophical problems about probability, the succession of amplitude, how little we really understand, and so on. And the fact that there's two different kinds of photons is not qualitatively different. It just means a little bit more calculation, but of the same style. It doesn't change the style of the analysis. And therefore, in spite of the fact that I've left out a number of things, such as how the amplitude changes with distance, and the fact that there's polarization, makes my lecture incomplete in the sense that I therefore have not given you the exact law for the propagation of light. Not quite, but damn close, so close, that it contains all the mysteries, all the peculiarities, and so forth in a perfectly satisfactory way. And I hope then that you're satisfied and you're confident that I haven't left any essential difficulty out. The things I've left out are not difficult. They take just another lecture of technical points rather than any new difficulty. One thing, though, I must say, and that is this. We've been talking about light going through a vacuum, and then I had a rule about it's reflected by a certain amount when it goes, it has a certain shrinkage when it comes off a surface. When it goes through a medium, it gets slowed up, and so on. These, it turns out, are not really the properties of light that have to do with the properties of matter. You can't get reflection without having a piece of glass. It doesn't go slower unless it's in the glass. It really, as it turns out, is not going slower. It's curious, and we're going to find out exactly what it does. In order to explain it, we have to know what the electrons in the glass are doing and how they interact with the light. And I'll summarize the most wonderful fact is that light never does anything, really, when you get down to it, except to go in a vacuum from one place to the other. It's emitted by one atom or particle and absorbed by another. And it never goes and gets slowed down or gets reflected. What reflection really is, is the light goes down, is absorbed by something which shakes it, and that emits a new light which comes back. Reflected light is really not the same photon coming back as went in. The photon from the source went into the glass, and from the glass comes out a new photon. This is an interesting thing that makes light in the end simpler and simpler and simpler. And uh, what I was trying to get to in the last step was to show how ultimately simple it is when it's only in a vacuum. And the complications of funny laws for reflection and funny laws for going through glass are really the result of the interaction of light and electrons. And that's why this subject of discussing physics can't go on any further until I want to discuss matter. And the next lecture will be about matter. All right? Thank you.
I put together a theory about photons and electrons, and I took it to my physics teacher, who said it's not right. Now, since he didn't describe the theory with great detail, I cannot answer. But I will say something that I forgot to say in the lecture. <laughs> One has the advantage of, uh, of uh, using questions to finish the lecture. I really had, I didn't, this is a, I must emphasize something that is a very great danger of talking about what happens in an experiment with one photon. Because after a while, you get the idea that these arrows are somehow associated with a single photon. It's a mistake, and I should have not permitted that mistake to be generated by mentioning as early as possible that it's not right, and that one of these, these amplitudes are not the amplitude to find a photon riding around somewhere, but the amplitude that an event occurred. And I give an example why your professor probably said no, by giving you a problem, so to speak, of the kind that we answer with these amplitudes, which is of a different style than the ones I've been mentioning and requires more thought. And I would just at least, I, then, as I say, I don't know exactly what your theory is, and maybe it's okay to satisfy this example, but nevertheless, let me know next time. The idea is, suppose that we have a problem with two photons. Suppose that we would like to know, just to take a definite example, that we have two sources of light, each one has been arranged to two sources A and B, and it's been arranged that both A and B emit one photon under some circumstance, and you have two counters down here, two photomultipliers, and you would like to know what is the probability they both go off. All right? So the event whose probability you're computing is the probability they both go off at the same time, that this both emit that there's a coincidence, that they both go off at the same time. Now this has an amplitude, the amplitude for the two photons, so to speak. In one, there's only one amplitude, the amplitude that both go off. And I have, should have emphasized that no matter what the event, no matter how many you're involved with and so on, you talk about the complete event and calculate the probability of it, not the probability for each photon. Now in this case, to compute the amplitude for a photon, to both phot uh, counters to go off, supposing that one photon came from each of the sources, it has to be done as follows. One way it could happen would be that this A source made, gave a photon that that went off, and the B one gave a photon that made the other counter go off. Let's say this counter is called uh, X, and this one's called Y. X went off because it received a photon from A, and Y went off at the same time because it simultaneously received a photon from B. The net result